my name is Sandy Warren. I am with uh, the Triunfo Water and Sanitation District. I'm glad to see everybody here this evening. Um, just a couple of points of logistics. Uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function or raise your hand and uh, we will be answering questions at the end of tonight's session, uh, but we can gather them as we go. If you'd like to type them in or save them and uh, we can uh, answer your raised hand at the appropriate time. Um, we are recording this session so that uh, everyone will have a chance to uh, enjoy the link afterward, particularly those who may not have been able to join us. Uh, also, um, I would at this point like to introduce Raymond Tulander, who is the chair of the Triumphal Water and Sanitation District Board. Ray? Thank you, Sandy. And I just want to take a quick minute to say that Triumphal is very proud to be able to bring these sessions to you. We hope you find them both informational and useful in your use and broaden your horizons on the fact that we do have real water issues here in Southern California. Reclamation, recycling, conservation are with us to stay. It's not just here for an occasional drought year. And so the more you can learn about it and learn how to take care of your yards and landscaping in an environmentally sound way is extremely useful. And with that, I wanna turn this back to the very capable hands of Sandy. It's all yours, Sandy. Thank you, Ray, I appreciate it. Um, my pleasurable duty right now is to introduce our presenter, uh, and that is Antoine Kunj. He is the Community Resilience Coordinator of the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains <clears throat> and a doctoral candidate in environmental science and engineering at the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Antoine coordinated the creation of the website defensiblespace.org, and he currently runs the wildfire preparation and home ignition zone evaluation programs for the RCD. His doctoral research focuses on understanding the barriers to home hardening and firewise landscaping implementation in wildland urban interface communities of Southern California. And our recent fire seasons have certainly brought to a uh, tragic view the wildland urban interface communities. So with that, Antoine, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Sandy. And th thank you, Ray, and all the board at the Triumphal Water and Sanitation District for hosting us tonight. Uh, it's definitely a very important topic in Southern California. We are entering fire season, and it's very important for people to get a better understanding of how they can reduce the risk of wildfire and the risk of ignition on their property by looking at their structure itself, but also at the landscape that surrounds it. Uh, so I'll be talking about all these topics tonight. And as Cindy mentioned, if you have any question, feel free to put them in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So just to, before we start, I want to say a few words about the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains, because not all of you may be familiar with the organization that we represent. The RCD of the Santa Monica Mountains is a special district of the state of California, and we work extensively to promote land stewardship and resource conservation throughout the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, we are funded with a very small portion of uh, residence property tax, and most of our funding comes from grants, from public agencies, foundations, education contracts, research and restoration services, as we have a team of biologists also uh, on our staff. Uh, and all donations to the RCD are, of course, tax dedu deductible because of the nonprofit status. So before we start talking about the landscape, uh, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the wildfire risk and what it means when we talk about the wildfire risk in certain areas. So there are four components when you talk about wildfire. Um, the first one is the likelihood, which is the prob probability of a wildfire burning in a specific location. So this is purely geographic, linked to topography, vegetation types, 
uh, and this is a very important aspect of, of course, of the hazard of wildfire. The second component is the intensity, which is the amount of energy that is released or expected to be released during a wildfire. And that has mostly to do with the type of vegetation on site. The exposure, here you have two different types of exposure. The first one would be the, the vegetation that is directly adjacent to your structure, to your home, which is extensively what we're gonna talk about tonight, <clears throat> sorry. And indirect exposure, if you live in Southern California, if you've lived here for several years, you're very well aware of a fire regime that is essentially wind-driven um, and the risk that represent embers during the fire season that can ignite structure one to two miles away from the fire line. So it's very important for homes to be hardened against embers as well as the landscape. And finally, the susceptibility uh, of a home or community to be damaged if the wildfire occurs. And this links back to the type of materials that are used on the structure and how hardscape and landscape are balanced on a property. So to summarize, the risk of wildfire is basically those four components. Likelihood and intensity make, uh, make up what we call the hazard and the vulnerability comes from exposure and susceptibility of damage to the property. So now the most interesting part is how you can reduce the risk of wildfire. So there are different things that you can do. The first one is always to start with the home and I will talk very briefly about home hardening. This is not the main topic for this presentation, but I will encourage you to visit the different resources I will be mentioning to take a look at your structure, take a look at your home and take any measure you can to protect it against wildfire. You, you can use fire resistant materials. And as I mentioned before, really pay attention to the most vulnerable features for amber intrusion, which are, are the vents, for example. The defensible space, we will be talking extensively about the defensible space, talking about the different zone, including the amber resistance zone that constitute the first five feet around your home. The firewise landscaping guidelines and maintenance and spacing. I will say that word a lot tonight, maintenance. It's extremely important when you talk about vegetation around structures. And community preparedness is another section that I would like to mention as well, since you are only uh, as safe as the weakest link in your community. So it's very important to share information, share best practices, organize your neighborhood to resist and to be resilient to a disaster. You can use programs like the Map Your Neighborhood programs. And I know the city of LA has adapted that program to really push communities to be more resilient and organized around disasters, not only wildfire, but also earthquakes, for example. So a defensible space will be the focus tonight. So how does a house catch fire? You have basically three main ways that a house can catch fire. And that is very important when you look at your landscape and you try to understand how a fire can move on your property, move from one uh, bush or tree to another part of the landscape and eventually to the structure. So the first one is obviously direct flame contact. If you have uh, the fire front coming on your property up to your structure. The second one, as I mentioned before, are the embers that can travel a couple of miles away from the front lines, depending on the wind conditions. So it's very important also that you take a look at the, the vegetation immediately around your structure. For example, you see in that image in the middle of the slide that there, there is vegetation right against the structure, right below the windows. And you can see that that vegetation has been ignited by the embers, creating a very strong source of heat and direct flame contact against the house. And finally, the third type is radiant heat. So in that case, they take the example of a tool shed that has been ignited by embers and that is generating enough radiant heat to uh, eventually catch the, the nearby house. So keep in mind that in Los Angeles County and in Ventura County, more than half the houses damaged or destroyed by wildfire are ignited by embers. So that's a really important factor when you look at your landscape. 
I'm going to play a 30 seconds video that will show you the importance of home hardening, but also of the um, defensible space, those first five feet I mentioned, the immediately around the house. That video was shot at the um, Institute for Insurance uh, Business and Home Safety. They do a lot of study around wildfire and around embers, and they have those massive warehouse where they have recreated uh, ember, ember condition with really the ability to create ember storms on the test structures that they have. And what you've seen in that video is the importance of the home hardening part and the vegetation. Yeah, you can see the, the house that caught fire on the left side no, not only had vegetation in the immediate proximity of the house, but it also had wood siding and different features that were very vulnerable to, to embers. The one on the right was pretty well hardened and it had like five feet of non-vegetation, which avoided uh, uh, having a, a source of radiant heat and direct flame right around the house. So I will be referring tonight to the website defensiblespace.org. Uh, the full title that we have is Sustainable Defensible Space. Um, that project came online in September 2020 after about 18 months of coordination between fire agencies, researchers, local nonprofits, state agencies, um, that really worked together to put together a platform that presented the best practices for home hardening, for landscaping, for native plants, for sustainable landscape, and for community preparation. So it's really, it's a very rich and dense website. There are a lot of information on there. And the goal is really to present people with the best solution they can have to reduce the risk of ignition on the property while maintaining the habitat in the Santa Monica Mountains, the habitat that we all love and cherish. And where most of the people who live in the Santa Monica Mountains really want to preserve that habitat while reducing the risk of wildfire that they are exposed to. So if you go online, again, defensiblespace.org, and I will be using some visuals from the website during this presentation, you will find a lot of information on here. Those are all the members of our technical advisory committee who participated in the creation of the websites. The website was funded by a grant from CAL FIRE through the climate investment programs. And members of our technical advisory committee included the California Native Plant Society, the California Fire Science Consortiums, California State Parks, the County of Los Angeles Fire Department, the Las Virginas, um, uh, the, sorry, the Los Angeles County uh, Department of Regional Planning, the Mountains Restoration Trust, the National Park Service, especially the unit in charge of the Santa Monica Mountains, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, the Theodore Payne Foundation, the North Topanga Canyon Fire Safe Council, Tree People, the under famous environmental nonprofit, USGS, um, the University of California Agricultural and Natural Services Department, the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA and the Ventura County Fire Department. And the production of the website was contracted with the landscape design firm Rios and the IT solution firm First Cheney. So I'm going to be very brief about home hardening, but it's it's always important to start with the home when you talk about wildfire. So I will give you uh, a few pointers of what to look for, where to find the information so that you can uh, dive deeper into it and look at your structure to reduce the risk. This is a screenshot from our website. I don't expect you to read all the information that is there. I just want to present you the structure of what we have available on there. So at the very top of that slide, you see that we have dedicated 
a page for each feature of the house. We are talking about the roof, we're talking about the eaves, the overhangs, the soffit, the gutters, the vents, the windows, the doors, the walls, the fences, uh, and I'm sure I'm missing some, but we are talking about all those features and we give you recommendations for new constructions and retrofits and maintenance. Uh, I mentioned I will say maintenance a lot during that presentation, but you have guidelines and recommendation for all those categories. The information in, is presented in a user-friendly way where we try to give people a checklist of things to check. So for example, on the left-hand side here, you have the um, section dedicated to the vents. I mentioned that the vents were very vulnerable uh, in uh, wildfire and to amber intrusion. So the one recommendation I will mention today about wildfire risk and amber intrusion is uh, upgrade your vents if you have any, if you have attic vents, foundation vents, ridge vents on your roof, make sure that you have one eighth of an inch mesh screen on your vents to prevent ember intrusion. That size of mesh screen is kind of like the sweet spot to prevent as many embers as possible from getting into your structure while at the same time maintaining airflow. And if you have attic vents, you should consider having a uh, gabble vents to even like, um, uh, modify really the, the airflow of the embers to prevent them from reaching your attic, for example. On the right, you have uh, the same kind of checklist for rain gutters that can also be a very high risk of wildfire, especially when you have vegetation accumulated in them. All that information is available on the website. I would encourage you to visit it, to look at all the other categories and do a self-assessment of your home. So remember, fortifying, retrofitting your home can be the best defense against ember intrusion. It really is. Maintenance is critical. Removing dead uh, leaf litter, dead vegetation debris around your home will reduce the amount of fuel in the proximity of your house that can be ignited by embers or by flame contact. Vents, as I mentioned, are extremely vulnerable. Make sure they are properly mitigated. And finally, we have a, prog a program running at the RCD. Uh, it's a home ignition zone evaluation program where we come on site, we visit your home, we look at the structure, we look at the landscape and give you a top five recommendation, top five priorities of things you should be doing to reduce the risk of ignition on your property. If you are interested in uh, having an evaluation, e feel free to email me. You have my email address on the screen. It's a free program. It's grant funded, so take advantage of it. Now let's talk about the landscape. Let's talk about the defensible space. So you, as you've seen on a previous slide, we talk about sustainable defensible space. So what do we mean when we talk about sustainable? Uh, we focused exclusively on the first 100 feet around the home. Depending where you live, depending the county, depending the location, the local fire department may require up to 200 feet of defensible space. If they ask you to do that, they, they are the ultimate authority. We focused on the first 100 feet because it's the area that you know, has the most impact in terms of habitat fragmentation and fire safety. But we are not the ultimate authority as to how far you should go for your defensible space. That is up to the fire department. The goal is to increase home and community resistance to wildfire while at the same time safeguarding firefighters' life and promoting native habitat and ecological resilience. It's really about making sure that everybody's lives are saved, safe and that habitat fragmentation is limited. So increasing wildfire resilience while maintaining and enhancing habitat quality. So if you are familiar with the concept of defensible space, you will be familiar with the different zones. If you are not, the defensible space is the area around your home. So here I talked about 100 feet around your home and it's subdivided in different zones. Each zone has different priorities and different recommendations regarding vegetation. The goal of what we call the amber resistant zone, which is the zone those first five feet around the structure, the goal is really to avoid ignition from any source, from embers, from direct flame, from anywhere. 
you want to create a barrier around your home so that the fire doesn't travel up to your structure. And that zone, those five feet, have the greatest impact on reducing the loss risk on your property. So really pay attention to it. The current guidelines um, that was updated in October 2020 with a new bill at the uh, State Assembly, AB 3074, is recommending people to have absolutely no vegetation in those, in those first five feet uh, and to not have organic mulch. You can have uh, gravel mulch, you can have something that is not combustible, but it is recommended to really limit the amount of uh, vegetative material that you have in that area. And I will show you a couple of examples right after that slide. So in this picture, you can see that the landscape is extremely well maintained. Uh, you have a well uh, maintained lawn. You can see also that the shrub that are growing against the house that is a stucco, ha stucco house, so it's good for wildfire resistance, are uh, trimmed up. So they're not touching the ground. And so in case there's any type of leaf litter on the ground that could be ignited by the embers, it could reduce the risk of a fire uh, going from the ground to the shrubs and eventually to uh, anything combustible on the structure. However, it is still a risk, especially when you see this big window uh, right above the, the shrubs. Windows, even if they are, are dual pane, uh, can be vulnerable to radiant heat. And if for any reason those shrubs catch fire, they will be a very important source of radiant heat right against the window that could possibly break and become an entry point for embers or um, of the fighter. And you see that you also have a palm tree less than three feet away from the structure that could also pose a risk, especially with the fronds uh, and potential vents or roof that can be exposed from those. This is another example of that zero to five feet zone. And what you can see here is that a very different type of organization where you have gravel, you don't have mulch, but you still have some plants. You have some succulents, you have some uh, annual flowers that have a very high moisture content. So even though it's not completely free of vegetation, it is a very fire wise vegetation. It's a vegetation that is not gonna generate a lot of debris, a lot of leaf litter or duff. So the risk of ignition here is extremely low. And the fact that they played around with stones and gravel of different size, you have those also massive and beautiful stones uh, on the foreground. It gives you an idea of how you can still create a very enticing uh, amber resistant zone with following firewise safety guidelines. Uh, the second zone, uh, and I realize that the slide has a mistake, it is not the amber resistance zone, it is the house protection zone. Uh, it goes from five feet to 30 feet from the house. In case you are on a slope, and we will talk about slope as well later, that zone can extend to 50 feet from the house because uh, the fire will move faster and more easily going uh, upwards on the slope. So you should increase the, uh, the distance uh, between plant species and for that zone. So the goal here is really to create a low ignition landscape capable of slowing down the fire spread, which is why we extend it to 50 feet when you are on a slope. The goal here is really to have lean, clean, green, well-irrigated, well-maintained plants. You go from low density planting when you are near the house, when you are at that five feet zone. And when you are at five feet, you, you are free to use organic mulch. Uh, I would recommend using composted mulch and not the very thick, very big the bark nugget mulch. The reason for that is that bark nugget mulch will generate higher flame and higher temperature if it is ignited by embers than composted mulch will. So, Prefer composted mulch, and it's also better for your plants to have composted mulch versus bark mulch. So going from a low density planting to medium density planting as you move outwards, it's really this idea of you start from the house and you move outwards and you slowly 
do a gradient or a transition into the nat natural environment to reduce habitat fragmentation. So of course you want to use native plants. You are in the heart of your irrigated zone. So if you're using um, native plants, you would likely use drip irrigation rather than uh, sp uh, spray irrigation that is more recommended for lawns. But in the, in the context of native vegetation, we don't recommend having a lawn because of the water consumption. Really think in terms of islands of vegetation, and I will talk about spacing and how much of different, um, how much of ground cover, how much shrubs you can have as a group before you need to like break it down and have maybe some hardscape, a walkway or something to create a separation so that in case you have an ignition, of one of those little islands, you re reduce the risk of transmission to the rest of your landscape. So playing with hardscape, hardscape kind of like we saw in the previous picture where they use different size of stones and gravel can be actually very fun and be a very good result for your landscape. So this is an example of this like gradient of vegetation I mentioned. So you see that right outside the house, uh, when you pass the overhang, you don't have vegetation, you have the walkway there. So you, they didn't put the vegetation around the house, they put the walkway there and they have a vegetation further away. And they have mulch that is also five feet away from the structure. Uh, and you see that they have kind of like low growing plants, shrub type of plants. And as you move outward, you can see, especially in the background that then they have trees and they have denser vegetation. So that's a kind of like, um, firewise and guidelines you want to follow when you're thinking of how to design or to modify your landscape. Here's another uh, version of that. Same thing, you have the first five feet that are the walkway or seating area. And as you move outwards, you have first low ground cover shrub types, and you can see in the background those taller trees and taller vegetation. The thing they don't have on that image it's kind of separation in between the vegetation. So they have the five feet separation from the house. They have a pretty much continuous vegetation in the zone one, in the home protection zone. The zone two uh, is the thinning zone. So I'm sorry of that the slide say, still says ember resistant zone. This one is the thinning zone uh, where it really serves as a connection to the natural environment and it goes uh, to 100 feet, the fire department can require for that zone to go up to 200 feet. Uh, it's not a heavy modifi vegetation modification zone. It's really about eliminating continuous dense vegetation, looking at what we're gonna talk about later also, those few ladders um, that can help propag propagate a fire across your property. So we want to avoid that. Uh, so up to 30 or 50 feet, up to 100 feet, more if required. Always think about spacing and maintenance, and I will detail that just, uh, just later. And really use native vegetation. You, you can use ornamental non-native plants when you're very close to your home or in potted plants. Do not use invasive plants, but ornamental are acceptable. But when you move outward, when you are in that zone up to like almost like 30, 100 feet from your home, really focus on native plants because you really want that transition to the, the nat natural environment, that ecological transition. And also native plants are adapted to the climate. They don't require constant irrigation. So usually when you pass 30 feet, you are outside of your irrigation zone. So you want plants that will be able to thrive in the in the climate zone where you are located. And finally, the surrounding wildland. So here it's really about supporting the ecosystem services of the chaparral of the coastal sage scrub of the oak woodland you may be located in. Uh, it, here it's really about removing invasive species if you see any and coordinate with your neighbors on a community-wide fire-wise plan because most of the property do not extend beyond 100 feet. Um, so you will probably be within your neighbor property when you reach 100 feet. 
And it's really important to talk about those different zones to work together on the type of vegetation that you have, for example, on uh, each side of a fence that you have in common to try to ha really have this community aspect to firewise, because if you do everything right in terms of home hardening and firewise landscaping, and your neighbor is not aware of the guidelines, you may still be at risk. So engage with your neighbors, work together to reduce your shared risk to wildfire. Do not remove vegetation to bare soil. Sometimes we see that uh, excessive clearance because people tend to think that the less vegetation, the lower the risk, and it doesn't correlate. It doesn't work that way. When you eliminate all of the vegetation, you can actually eliminate some of the near ground vegetation that could have caught embers um, before reaching your structure. So you may actually increase your risk when you really remove all of the vege vegetation. Uh, not only that, you can also create some slope stability issue, erosion issues, in addition to disturbing the, the, the native habitat. Now we're going to talk about plant selection. And it's one of my favorite topic when people ask me what is a fire resistant plants. So we're going to talk about that. So what is a fire resistant plant? Uh, fire resistant plants are really those that do not readily ignite. It doesn't mean that they're never going to ignite. They still can catch fire. Um, but the type of leaf that they have, their foliage, their stem, their chemical composition, make them that they will not be uh, contributors or not great contributors to fuel and fire intensities, but they can still burn. As I mentioned, there are several factors that can affect the fact that a plant is uh, fire resistant or not. Or not. Uh, and those include the moisture content, the age, the health status of the plant, the volume of dead material that you have in the crown, and the chemical content. Very often people talk about plant lists, and there are a lot of them. There are a lot of fire resistant plant lists out there. Um, they can be very, uh, very good tools when you're doing firewise gardening and when, when you're getting into native plants, because very often those lists are, are native firewise plant. But they can give you the wrong impression. Uh, sometimes people think that by taking a plant from a plant list, they've done all the work. And they're like, oh, okay, I planted a plant that is fire resistant, I'm good to go. When it's a, a lot about the conditions, it's conditions over species. You need to make sure that your plant is well irrigated, well located, uh, well maintained, trimmed, pruned uh, to really reduce the risk. You can have a plant from a firewise plant list that can become a real fire hazard if it's not maintained and a plan that is not on that list, that can be totally fine if it's absolutely well maintained. So plant list can be useful, but they also can be misleading. And here we are with the key word of the evening, maintenance. It's really about maintenance and the conditions. Any plant species can burn under the right conditions. So then what are the characteristics if that plant list are not the answer and all? Uh, what should, be, who should you be looking for? Uh, broadleaf plants are usually good firewise plants. Plants with high moisture content. And when you look at the leaves, those, those plants can easily bend. That means they have a very high moisture content in them. Plants with thick leaves also have a higher moisture content and can uh, resist wildfire more easily. They, they may have a composition that may harden them against uh, wildfire or against embers. Plants without fragrance. Uh, I love sages, but you know that sages, eucalyptuses, all those plants that have very uh, wonderful fragrances mean they have oils and oils usually are very flammable. Plants with silver or gray leaves are usually a safe bet. Uh, if you pay attention to the leaf again, some of them, and especially some of the gray plants actually, may have leaves, uh, hair on their leaves. So make sure that you check all the characteristics before making a decision on which plant you are uh, putting in your landscape. The sap uh, 
uh, of plants is also very important. Sometimes you have plants with a white colored sap. Those plants are usually not fire wise or fire resistant. The plants with a sap that look a lot like water is usually the one you should go for. In fact, and the plants that do not produce dry leaf litter, we talked about that earlier. If it generates a lot of leaf litter, a lot of dust that accumulates on top of the soil, that is ideal for embers to go and ignite those. And then you have a fire starting on, the, on your property that can travel and eventually reach your structure. Large green trees and shrubs maintain without dead branches and cluster of dead leaves are usually a safe bed. And we're gonna talk about how you can make sure that those trees and those shrubs do not transmit fire one to another. So good maintenance is fire resistance. That, that, is, uh, that is very true. You can see on that diagram that some of the characteristic of the plant that we just talked about. So the moisture content, the chemical content, the life expectancy, the morphology, which means like the, the form of the plant, the structure of the plant, all of that are characteristic of the species itself. So you don't really have an influence on that. Although you do have some influence on the moisture content based on how much you irrigate that plant. You have control on the dead material, meaning you can trim and prune the plant to reduce the risk significantly. And this little diagram is a reminder that each season has its seasonal maintenance task. Um, and you can find more information about what you should do in the fall versus the spring or the summer, depending on the, on the plants that you have. Uh, when you should prune your pine trees versus your oak trees, uh, when you should do heavy irrigation, when you should do planting, all of that information you can find on our website. Quickly talking about invasive, uh, if you, you've seen probably those beautiful yellow flowers all over the hills, uh, this is black mustard and it's an invasive grass. And so why is it bad? Well, for different reasons. The first one is that it displays native vegetation and it degrades wildlife habitat. Like a lot of the native plant vegetation that we have here in Southern California, we have it for a good reason, in that the ecosystems are built on those species, native species composition. You have insect species, you have bird species, you have wildlife that is relying on those native plants. And so when you see invasives colonizing a whole area, that impact the whole ecosystem and all the, the wildlife that is in that, in that area. The thing with black mustard especially is that it produces a lot of biomass, like it grows very fast and very tall, and then it dries out very quickly. And it ends up that at the beginning of fire season, uh, after, high temperature, maybe after heat waves, you're gonna have those standing dry stem covering the hills that are ideal fuel for wildfire to, to just roam through them very quickly. Uh, so not only does it provide fuel for wildfires, but it also will impact uh, soil erosion and the streams and rivers by, uh, since you're increasing erosion in the, in the uh, ground dirt that accumulates in those creeks. So now that I've told you that native uh, plant lists are not the solution, I'm going to give you a plant list. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a full plant list. I'm going to give you a few examples. Uh, but take with a grain of salt, we might, uh, remember that those are only three examples. I think I have maybe nine examples in total. There are a lot more native plants that you can use in your landscape that are fire-wise, drought tolerant, will help you reduce your water bill as well. Uh, so all those are available on the website as well. We have a lot more, but remember what I said about plant list. It's also about the conditions and the maintenance. So we have the Toyon, obviously, with the beautiful uh, red fruits. We have the California sycamore and the Coast Live Oak. Coast Live Oak are like very emblematic of the Santa Monica Mountain. They're beautiful, and we have some beautiful specimen all across the, uh, in the area. Uh, the interesting thing is that they seem to play a role in filtering out embers during the wildfire. Their leaves are extremely hard to ignite. So it, it seems there is no, we don't have uh, evidence like empirical evidence of that yet, but 
it seemed that they may play a role in filtering out embers. We have some shrubs, uh, lemonade berry, laurel sumac, golden currant, all beautiful type of species. So if you are wondering about what type of shrubs you can have on your property, look at those. The laurel sumac is very easy to, to maintain. It may overgrow so on some properties, so it may require a bit more maintenance to keep it under control, but it's still a great native option. Uh, the Matilija poppy, I don't know if you've seen those fried egg before, but they are magnificent. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of sages. Uh, remember that uh, plants with fragrances means that they have some oils. So if you use sages, don't use them in like the immediate proximity of the house. Like keep them a little bit further in the landscape. And we also have snowberry. And in terms of ground cover, we have uh, salt bush, two different kinds, and the uh, coyote bush. So all of that you can find on defensiblespace.org. So I said we were talking about placement and spacing. So we are going to do that now. I mentioned few ladders before. Few ladders are what you can see on that image here on the right, where you have embers that will ignite, could ignite mulch, could ignite leaf litter that you have on the ground, couch, uh, catch a ground cover, the ground cover being very close to the shrub, it will catch the shrub and then catch the tree. So this kind of like positioning of the plants, in that case, it's definitely not ideal because you are creating that ladder that allows a fire to move from the ground to a canopy making it much more dangerous when it reaches the, the, the larger trees on a property. So the goal here is to not provide a continuous path of fuel for the fire. You want to cut that ladder. You want to remove that ladder. And how do you do that? Well, you look at separation distances between ground covers, shrubs, and the trees. For example, here in that case, uh, the recommendation would be to trim, usually the recommendation is to trim trees up to uh, about a third of the total height from the ground, not to exceed six feet from the ground. Uh, so if you think that the clearance required to remove the fuel ladder is going to go above six feet, you should trim down the vegetation above the tree rather than trimming, uh, than trimming the tree more than six feet high. Uh, it's really important then to really space the plants properly, prune them properly at the right time through the year. Some plants uh, prefer to be trimmed uh, in the fall, some prefer in the winter. So you can also find that information online. Uh, here you have an example of vertical clearance, but keep in mind that both vertical and horizontal continuity need to be addressed. This is another diagram that can kind of like show you uh, what it means when you're talking, especially on the slope. So here you have a slope that like slowly increases and we live in the Santa Monica mountain. So a lot of people are gonna have a significant slope on their property. That means that you need to increase the distances between um, the horizontal and the vertical currents so between the grouping of shrubs, the grouping of ground covers and the trees. Uh, those diagrams are not perfect and we are well aware of that. Uh, for example, on a slope like that, for example, here, those distances are based on uh, an ordinance from the Ventria County Fire Department, if I remember correctly, when they try to come up with a uh, uh, distance for different type of vegetation. But here we issue that, for example, between different uh, shrubs on the moderate slope of 20 to 40 percent, you have like 40 feet of uh, of nothing, which is not realistic. Uh, and you do not want to have an empty, empty space like that because it will have uh, issues with um, uh, erosion, slope stability, and it will also provide an opportunity for invasive to colonize the area and eventually become uh, fire, uh, fuel for fire. So those guidelines can be helpful in understanding the concept of horizontal and vertical clearance. But again, you need to be critical and adapt them to your property so that you do not create an additional risk for the stability of your slope or for invasion by invasive uh, plants. 
the guideline, the kind of like idea that you want to have is for ground cover. So if you have like a mosaic of ground cover, you do not want to exceed 500 square feet of continuous coverage. You want to break that down, as you mentioned earlier, with like hardscape or walkways, stones, something that really create a, a separation and like air out your landscape. Uh, you want to space them like twice the height of the ground cover if you have a slope uh, under 20%. If it's 20 to 40% slope, you want to go to spacing four times the height of the ground cover. So it can still be a reasonable distance, depends on the, on the height of the plant that you have as a ground cover on your property. For shrubs, you don't want shrubs that are usually much taller, they can have a lot more material in their canopy. So you don't want to exceed 50 square feet of continuous stack of a continuous grouping of shrubs. And same thing here, you have 20 feet spacing. I said, I mentioned the 40 feet spacing on slope. Um, that is really, you need to, to be careful with that because it may not be the correct solution for, for your property, for slope stability and for invasive. So I put that disclaimer here. Those distances are still under development. Uh, it's not a good idea to have large empty spaces on slopes. Uh, especially in our area. Hardscape can be your friend when you're talking about how you can reduce uh, the fire risk on your property. You can use pavement. If you do that, try to use porous pavement that can allow for rainfall to go through and infiltrate the ground. Uh, you can use dry creek beds that are usually a very good solution. Depending on your slope, if you have issue with slope stability, you can use retaining walls. That can also be a good idea to create a, a, a fire break. The fire, the fire could stay at the bottom or at the top of the wall, depending on the conditions, uh, but that could be very helpful. Uh, boulders, soil burns, all of that are very useful tools uh, to create this, can, this idea of islands of vegetation in your landscape. And maintenance, so that is the, I believe the last section that I have for you tonight. It's all about maintenance. So we're gonna to try to come up with a checklist. Um, the maintenance is definitely the most cost-effective way to protect your home and your landscape. I will never say it enough. Uh, it is the key to good uh, fire safety. Pruning your shrubs and your trees to remove that horizontal and vertical clearance between the plants will help you uh, in, uh, in, in creating a firewise landscape. And it will also help removing the dead material from a canopy. So very often when we talk about trimming a tree, it can be uh, uh, just a purely maintenance trimming of removing that dead material up to a more important structural trimming where you want to ask a certified arborist to help you with that to make sure you don't create unbalances in the canopy that may result in the tree falling over in, under certain conditions. Uh, remember that permits may be required depending on your location and on the species, uh, especially if you're talking about oak trees or native plants, very often they require a permit. I mentioned leaf litter and dead leaves, uh, pine needles, all of that are kindling for embers to be to ignite them. So make sure you remove them to prevent a fire from starting on your property. Try to use a rake and not a wind um, a leaf blowers. Leaf blowers are first of all illegal in the city of LA even if it's not very well respected. Uh, but it will also blow away the topsoil uh, of your property that is like, very important for your sustainability uh, of your plants and the health of your, of your landscape. And finally, don't forget your home. And there are a lot of uh, maintenance checklist items regarding the home. The one that I put here is about the gutters. Make sure that you don't have vegetation debris accumulating in your gutters that could be ignited by embers exposing your roof uh, to direct flames. One solution for that is obviously to clean your gutters and to use leaf guards and kind of like a mesh screen that would prevent vegetation and leaf litter to accumulate in the gutter. So a few takeaway points that I wanted to share. 
All plants will eventually burn. It's about the conditions more than it is about the species. We want people to use native plant species because of water use, because of native habitat and the ecosystem services they provide to the wildlife. Um, so keep that in mind, use native plants, maintain them well, space them properly, and you are already far along the way. Spacing, vertical and horizontal clearance to avoid those few ladders that as I mentioned. Brush clearance doesn't mean that you need to go bare ground. I said it earlier, it can actually increase your risk if you remove all the vegetation around your home. Native firewise landscaping, along with home hardening, those two go together to really re reduce the risk of ignition on your property. Here are a few additional resources that I have for you. So remember defensiblespace.org is where I got most of the information that you have uh, that has been presented tonight. Some additional resources, you have a book by Carol Bornstein and other authors about California native plants. You have several guides about California native and drought tolerant gardens. This one from the Las Virgenes Municipal Water District is very well done. Would encourage you to take a look. Uh, California watershed approach to landscaping, the fire recovery guide, and a few other options from the California Native Plant Society and the Theodore Payne Foundation. So those two organizations, the California Native Plant Society and Theodore Payne Foundation, will guide you in creating a truly sustainable, native, and beautiful landscape. And that is all that I have for you tonight. So thank you again for hosting us. Thank you, Antoine. Very, very informative. Uh, I wanted to let folks know that uh, we will make a link available by uh, email. So if you would like to download a copy of uh, tonight's presentation, you may do so. That will go out within the next day or so. We do have a couple of uh, questions in the queue here. Uh, first one being, my community homeowners very much enjoy the Mediterranean climate in the area. Bougainvillea plants grow well here and are prominent in the face of many homes here. What is your recommendation regarding vines on building? Uh, vines on buildings are usually not a great idea, especially when you're talking about bougainvillea. Bougainvillea are beautiful plants. They are very well adapted to the Mediterranean climate. They create, they can create a lot of dry branches and dead material in the canopy. Um, the recommendation is not to have vine growing on a structure, even if the structure is a, a stucco house. Uh, having stucco will reduce the risk. Um, but a bougainvillea can ignite very easily and that would create a fire right on the siding. So it's better to have those plants a bit a further away and maintain them so that they can bloom profusely, but not on the structure. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, are there any suggestions for native fire safe plants that also support fauna? like bees, butterflies, or birds? Or are they often mutually exclusive? That's a great question. And uh, the one that I'm thinking, right, so I'm not a botanist. I'm not an expert on plants. I can like give you a few pointers, but the one that I have, for example, here, I have a lot of sages. Uh, I have some plants that are uh, penstemones as well that are also native plants. And I can tell you they've been blooming recently and I've seen hummingbirds and native bees uh, coming around. So usually when you go for native plants that bloom like sages, penstemone, all those kind of flowering plants, you will see a lot of wildlife coming around. Great, and uh, this is a good question as well. I thought sumac was explosive. When it finally ignites, it can explode 10 to 15 feet out. Is that a myth? Uh, I am not sure about that. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about that, that fact. I know actually I wasn't, I haven't heard that from Sumac at all. I've heard something similar for Toyon. Uh, Toyon being a plant, also a native plant that is actually very resistant to ignition. Uh, but when they finally ignite, that can take a while, but when they ignite, they can burn pretty at, at, at pretty high temperature. 
so I don't know if it's the same case for sumac, but you need to make the difference very often between plants that can be fire retardants, so that can like take a, a while to ignite, and plants that are uh, fire resistant. So you, if it is the case, I don't know if it's the case for sumac. Uh, you want to have those plants further away uh, from your structure for sure and make sure that they're not directly aligned with, for example, vents uh, that can be a, a point of vulnerability on your structure. Great, and we've got one more question at this point. I have a downslope hillside that has rosemary on the hill. I back up to 1,600 acres of open space. Is rosemary bad? So great question also. We see rosemary very often when we do our home emission zone evaluation. Uh, we don't, it, talking about a, a species being bad or not, it's, I, I don't think it's the right angle. It's really about the condition and the location of the rosemary. If the rosemary is like right against the structure, if it's right against a, a wood uh, deck, I would tell you that it is a big risk. If it is down the slope, maybe 30, 50 feet away from a structure, uh, it doesn't have fuel, a fuel ladders connected to other areas of your landscape, it could be, it could be fine. Um, it's all about how far it is from other vegetation. If you created some separation in your landscape, and if you maintain it, rosemary can be very tricky as well in the fact that they have a lot of dry material in the center. Um, so really about location, maintenance, but it's not so much the species itself that is bad. It, it is a fragrant species with a lot of oil and dry material, so don't have it against structure, ideally not immediately in the zone one, um, but you can have it further away if you have proper guidelines of maintenance and spacing. Great, thank you, Antoine. And thank you everyone for participating tonight. If you have additional questions that may come up after the fact, I'm going to give you an email address that you can, uh, actually the same address that you may have used to sign up for tonight's session. And that is TWS, as in Sam, D, TWSD at triunfowsd.com. And you'll get that email address when I send out the uh, copies of the presentation. So it will be part of that. But with that, uh, I would like to again, thank everyone for attending. And Antoine, thank you for, boy, you came in right at uh, one minute before the hour mark. That's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, good. I'm impressed. <laughs> thank you all. And uh, again, if you have questions, we'd be delighted to receive them. Um, and you can look for a copy of the presentation within um, the next day or so. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a really pleasant evening. Thank you.